Hello, my name is Low G, and today is going to be a different type of video. A few days ago, a friend of mine sent me the link to John Mayer's most recent performance of his newest single, Last Train Home, on Jimmy Kimmel Live. So, of course, I'm going to click the link because it's John Mayer. So, as I'm watching the video and basking in the glory of his vocal tone and his guitar tone, I noticed there's one tiny little part of this performance that was kind of odd. I watched it again and realized that the audio was not the same thing as the video. What do I mean by that? The guitar lick that he was playing was not the guitar lick that I was hearing, meaning that tiny little piece of the performance was edited after the fact. Now, if you're not a performing musician, you might not realize that this sort of thing is pretty common. Even though it looks like a live performance, all the musicians are on stage playing together, it's actually more like a studio recording because each instrument is being recorded separate from one another and they essentially have as many runs of the song as they want to get the takes that they need. And once the whole day is done, they stitch together all the best moments of the show, which will eventually become the performance that you see. This is also very common in the stand-up comedy comedy world. A lot of comedians will run their set three or four times, pick the best versions of each bit, stitch it together, which will eventually be the show that you watch. Now, I'm not saying that this performance is like a Frankenstein combination of a variety of different sections from each take, like 10 seconds from this take and 30 seconds from this take and five seconds from this take. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this type of thing is possible. And if you don't know what to look for, you'll probably miss it. So what I'm gonna show you in this video is what he is playing versus what the guitar would actually look like when it matches the audio perfectly. Now before we begin, I have to say, in no way am I trying to say that John Mayer is a fraud or he's a fake or he's bad or anything like that. Quite the contrary. He's a legendary guitar player and is absolutely going to go down as one of the most influential guitar players of the past generation. He's one of those guys that just always sounds good. He always comes up with interesting, creative, different ideas that are also very simple, which is one of the most difficult things to do. Not to mention his amazing finger style playing and his amazing songwriting. But with all that in mind, let's get on to the proof. If you don't know anything about guitar, but you still want to keep track of what we're talking about, the best thing you can do is take note of what are called the fret markers. These are markers on the guitar neck that help the player keep track of what they're doing. If you take a look at John's guitar right here, you'll notice a little bird symbols that are on the 3rd, 5th, 7th, 9th, 12th, 15th, 17th, 19th, and 21st frets. The only fret that you need to think about, however, is the 12th fret, which is the easiest one to notice because it's the only fret that is surrounded with two frets on either side that do not have markers. If you take a look at my guitar, it's exactly the same thing, except I don't have birds, I have dots. John has birds on his guitar because that's the specific fret marker for the brand of guitar that he uses. But my guitar is the exact same thing. You'll notice my 12th fret is surrounded with two frets that do not have markers on either side. And you can see the layout is exactly the same as I layer these two necks on top of each other. Keep this 12th fret in mind because that's gonna be the reference that you'll use as we talk about this next part. If you wanna find the part for yourself, you can check out the video on Jimmy Kimmel's channel starting at 146 or John Mayer's channel starting at 134. So let's go to that part and see what it looks and sounds like. These little guitar parts are what I call filler licks, just little things that you play in the silence between vocal melodies, something that John is and has always been very good at. Let's dive in a little deeper and split these two licks up into individual parts. This first lick is exactly what it should look like. The audio is matching the visual perfectly, but the second lick is a little different. Like I mentioned earlier, when I heard that lick, it simply did not match what his hands were playing at that moment. Let's dive in a little deeper by showing you exactly how this lick is actually played. This is what that passage should look and sound like with just guitar. Let's watch and listen to that one more time and take note of where I am in relation to the 12th fret. You'll notice the first lick, I'm ahead of the 12th fret. But the second lick, I'm behind the 12th fret. 
Let's do that one more time, but with the audio from the actual performance, and you'll notice that the guitar parts are lining up more or less perfectly. Let's hear it one more time for good measure. Now that you have a better idea of what that part actually looks like, let's go back to the performance and zoom in on his hand during this moment and compare it with what I'm doing. Always keep in mind that 12th fret. Let's hear it one more time for good measure. You'll notice that first passage looks pretty much exactly the same, because it is. Our hands are doing the same things. We're playing the same frets, the same strings, and moving in the same way. But right off the bat, you can immediately notice at the beginning of the second lick, our hands are not in the same position. You can see this by looking for the 12th fret which on my guitar is here under my ring finger, but on his guitar is here under his pointer finger. You can also see our hands ending differently, with my hand ending on my pointer finger to the left of the 12th fret, and his hand ending on the ring finger to the right of the 12th fret. Let's watch that one more time. Now, many guitar players would have a very simple explanation for this. One of the hallmarks of the guitar that makes it a pretty unique instrument is that there are so many ways to play the exact same thing. So perhaps we're just playing the same lick in two different ways, which is very possible. We're even ending on the same note, even though they're in different locations. My pointer finger was on an E and his ring finger was on an E. So surely we're just playing the same thing in different ways. So let's dive in a little bit further to see if this is the case. Let's first go over what it looks like when the guitar parts are lining up perfectly. Take a look at the starting note of this first lick. Both of our ring fingers are on the 12th fret of the high E string. Afterwards, you can see both of our ring fingers sliding up two frets on the next string up. And then finally, you'll notice both of our pointer fingers playing that 12th fret E string again. However, you'll notice the first note of the next lick, our hands are not in the same position. The note that is happening is a B note, and you'll notice my ring finger playing that note on the 12th fret of the B string, but his ring finger is on the 15th fret of the B string, which is not a B. Now you might be saying, well, his hand looks different because he's playing the B in a different way in a different position. This B that is being played is a specific B, and there are four ways to play this on the guitar. You can play it here on the seventh fret of the top string, the 12th fret of the next string, the 16th fret of the next string, and the 21st fret of the next string. You can also get silly and play like a harmonic right here, but I highly doubt that's happening. Now of all those options, we know which ones he's definitely not playing. Remember, his hand is around here on the 12th fret, so we know he can't be playing this one or this one, which means he has to be either playing the 12th fret of the B string right here or the 16th fret of the G string right there. If we go back to the video, you can clearly see my ring finger playing one of those options. In this case, the 12th fret B on the B string. However, his ring finger is on the 15th fret B string, which is not a B, that is a D. Now you might be saying, wait a minute, he is playing a B. It's underneath his pointer finger. Look, his pointer finger is on the 12th fret B string, that is a B. And it just looks like his ring finger is down playing the string, but in reality, it's just gently lifted up above the string and the pointer finger is the one playing. Now this is a completely reasonable thought that I can demonstrate. Right now I'm about to use my ring finger to play the D. But right now my ring finger is actually lifted and my pointer finger is playing the B. This is absolutely possible and is something that I can definitely see happening. However for me the next part is a dead giveaway. The sound that you just heard is called a bend, which is when you put your finger on a string, press the string up or pull it down to raise the pitch. Sounds like this. Here's a normal note, and then here's that same note bent upwards. It's a very common guitar technique that people use to add some extra flavor or color to their playing. 
Now, this particular bend that's happening in this song, or at least this exact part, is a small bend, just a little one, not a big bend like this. It's more of a smaller one like this. Something like that. This exact bend is happening on the note F sharp. I'm playing an F sharp and bending away from that note. There are only five ways to play this exact F sharp on the guitar. You can play it on the second fret of the high E string. You can play it on the seventh fret of the B string. You can play it on the 11th fret of the next string up, the G string. The 16th fret of the D string. Or the 21st fret of the A string. Now, just like we talked about earlier with the B, we know the outer notes are definitely not happening because his hand is around here on the 12th fret. So there's only two F sharps that he could feasibly be playing. It's either the F sharp here on the 11th fret, right back one fret from the 12th, or here on the 16th fret, which is up four frets from the 12th. If we go back to the video, you can clearly see my ring finger bending the F sharp on the 11th fret of the G string, whereas his ring finger is still on the same string, but on the 14th fret. That is not an F sharp, that is an A. And in fact, none of his fingers are on any of the F sharp choices that I just went over. In this case, that would either be the 11th fret G string or the 16th fret D string. This is all the information that I need to definitively say that what I am seeing is not what I'm hearing. But if that's the case, what is he actually playing in the video? Is it some horrible lick filled with wrong notes that'll make you jump out the window when you hear it? Not at all. I actually went ahead and learned what his hand is doing, and I realized that the lick itself is just fine. Here's the part by itself. Let's listen to it again with the video footage and you'll see that our hands look more or less the same the entire time. Let's do it again, but this time with the audio from the performance. And you'll notice when I'm playing what he's actually playing in the video, it doesn't line up with the audio. Another interesting thing with the audio lick versus the video lick is that they're actually pretty similar in structure. If you see how it starts, they both start on a high note, then move down to the bend, they bend the string up, bring it back, and then continue down in pitch, moving to other strings. The main difference though is the audio lick that you're hearing is in E major, which is the key of the song, but the video lick that you're actually seeing him play in the performance is E minor. Now it might naturally seem like that's a mistake, but playing minor over major is an extremely common sound that players have been doing for over a century. In fact, he actually does this exact sound earlier and later in the song. Here he is playing minor over major in an earlier filler lick during the performance. Here he is again playing minor over major during sections of his solo towards the end of the performance. This brings us to the main question. Why was this part edited in the first place? Now the cynics and the haters will say it's because he messed up. So they just grabbed a better sounding lick from a different take and popped it in. Now this is possible, it could happen. I'm sure it's happened before, but I don't think this is the case. Mostly because if he is executing the lick that it looks like he's playing, meaning he's playing all the notes cleanly, there's no dead notes, etc., the lick is fine. Now if the lick was kind of random notes or notes that made no sense in the key, I might be able to believe that a little bit more, but the lick is perfectly fine. In my opinion, I think the reason why they edited it is a little bit less salacious and much more mundane. My guess is that it was a visual issue and not an audio one. For a performance like this, especially at the level of John Mayer, it can be a pretty big production. And with a big production, you usually have a lot of personnel, so something like this could easily happen. Let's say you have a camera guy shooting a show who's not familiar with the song. So he's shooting the show, John Mayer starts playing his great filler licks, but the camera guy's looking somewhere else. What do you have in that situation? You have audio of John Mayer playing great licks, but no video, which defeats the purpose. If you're watching or listening to John Mayer, you want to also see what he's doing. So in that situation, a different video take would have to be subbed in. 
or it could be something even simpler, like a lighting issue, or maybe they were zoomed in perfectly on John Mayer's hands, but you could see the bass player sneezing or something in the background. All of those things would probably require that take to be reshot or have a different take fit in at that moment. The next question you're probably asking yourself is, if they swapped out for a different video take, why wouldn't they just also use the matching audio take? And the answer is very simple. It's simply too time consuming, especially for a show like this that's probably on a deadline. When you have performances like this, you have the audio engineer putting all of the audio together, mixing, mastering, doing whatever they need to do. Then they send it out to the video editor who then edits the video on top of the audio. But if there's a problem in the video that doesn't match the audio, that means that they would have to go back to the audio engineer, fix the problem, render it again, send it out, and then re-edit the video render it all over again and repeat the process. That's extremely time consuming, especially when you're talking about people who are probably pretty busy with their lives and with various other projects, especially again when you're on a deadline. And especially when most people would never catch this tiny little error. And I guarantee you, these people who are making this product know that. With all that being said, there's one more point I wanna make as I wrap this video up. Let's say that John Mayer did make a blatant mistake and they didn't edit it out, they kept it in and released it like normal. Would that mistake hurt the performance? Would it hurt John Mayer as an artist? Would it hurt the song? Would it hurt his upcoming album? Would it hurt his guitar playing? No, it wouldn't hurt any of that. In fact, mistakes like that or little hiccups or mishaps are part of live performance. It's actually one of the coolest parts about seeing an actual live band because you're reminded, oh, I'm looking at a human being creating the sounds that I'm actually hearing in real time right in front of me. I've seen so many shows with legendary players making mistakes right in front of me. And to be honest, it's awesome every time. I've seen Thomas Hawk, the drummer of Meshuggah, pretty much screw up the intro to Bleed. I've seen Victor Wooten mess up one of his loops to the point where he had to say, hey, let me do that again. I've heard John Petrucci accidentally play an open G string in which the entire arena erupted with cheers. It's not something that we should be afraid of, it's something that we should sort of embrace when it happens. Unfortunately, we probably all know what would actually happen if they released a performance with a mistake. You'd see it in the comment sections. You'd see someone say, hey, did he make a mistake right there? And then five more people would say it, and then 10 more people would say it. And then worst case scenario, you have a full comment section of people saying how he's washed up, how he can barely play anymore, even though these are idiotic statements made by people who don't know anything. And even worst case scenario, this sort of thing could spread around the internet, which could actually impact the hype of his upcoming release, which could very well impact his career. This makes me ask the question, why do we love perfect performances, but sort of discard less than perfect performances? In my opinion, this is because most people, whether they realize it or not, don't actually appreciate the art form for simply what it is, an art form. What most people like is the display of human ability used to create that art form. This is something that I call the woe factor. It's something that makes you go, whoa, that was crazy. Even though it makes it feel like you're enjoying the art form, what you're really enjoying is the display of heightened human skill, which believe it or not, doesn't really have anything to do with the art form. Here's some examples. Let's say you see a piece of art at an art gallery and you think, eh, I don't really like it. But someone walks up to you and says, oh yeah, the painter painted that blindfolded and with their feet. If your reaction is, whoa, that's amazing, you have just been impacted by the wow factor. Some extra third party outside source just came in and changed your opinion. If you're not affected by the wow factor, your reaction should be something like, oh, that's pretty cool, I still don't like it. Or let's say you're on YouTube and you see some crazy shredding guitar player and you think, oh my God, this guy's amazing. But then you read on the internet somewhere that that performance was all faked. All of the notes were meticulously perfected and edited in the studio, and the guitar player was just miming over the video. If your reaction is, what? Oh, this sucks, I hate it. That means you were initially impacted by the wow factor. You were being influenced by the display of human skill, and that affected your opinion of the music. However, if you're not affected by the wow factor, your reaction should be something like this. Oh, it's all fake. I don't care. It still sounded awesome. 
there are tons of examples like this. Like if you're seeing a singer on Instagram and you're thinking, wow, this song is really great and she sounds really good, but then you learn that her vocal was all tuned, that shouldn't change your opinion of the song because the execution of the performance doesn't change the notes, doesn't change the melody, the chords, the chord progressions, the vocal tone, the musical tone, the lyrics, the song structure, the dynamics, the arrangement, none of those things change just because the performance was subpar. So yeah, I just think it's interesting that this thing exists and most people don't realize it. And even a player at the level of John Mayer and his production team still feel compelled to follow this crazy, unrealistic, and frankly, unmusical standard of perfection. Hope you enjoyed this video. See you in the next one.